the radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this uh, Sunday, September 22nd, and I'm I'm back trying to get a show done from beginning to end without the internet going berserk on me and dropping me and, and driving me crazy. I apologize for yesterday. It was crazy. It was ridiculous. It was, yeah, I was not happy. I do have all your super chats, so do not worry. We will get to all of them. Uh, it's just see Applejack just did his third Super Chat on the live stream. Thank you, Applejack. Really appreciate that. Alex, thank you. Drowski, thank you. Really appreciate you guys' support. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. I, I went to the reception at the hotel and complained, and I said, yeah, I, they noticed that the Internet kept dropping. Um, doesn't usually happen. And today they said, Internet seems stable. So here we are. Um, we will see if the gods of the Internet, at least at this hotel, actually uh, support that. Uh, today, I, um, I went down south in Israel to Sderot. Sderot is uh, the largest town um, uh, in what's called uh, in, in the vicinity of Gaza. So uh, one wrong turn and I would have been right in Gaza. <laughs> uh, lots of military blockades that couldn't have happened. But um, it was a little eerie, I have to admit, to be in a town where uh, Hamas and the Palestinians, uh, the Gazans, were in during uh, October 7th, where they committed some of their murders. Uh, and um, with people, some of which, there was a bunch of young people there who, who lived through uh, September 7th. Uh, at Sderot, there was a conference, uh, the Freedom uh, Conference. Uh, it's held annually every year uh, in Israel. I, I've attended a number of them, spoken at a number of them. Over the, over the many years, it is a conference of what you'd call classical liberals in Israel, um, some, uh, quite a few objectivists, but also um, uh, a variety of different conservatives, small libertarians, maybe even some bigger libertarians, I'm not sure, certainly small libertarians, religious, secular, but generally people who believe in separation of church and state, se uh, economic freedom, and, and a strong uh, Israeli military, again, with some disagreements and some uh, variations. Uh, I, um, I, did, I, I recorded three podcasts there uh, with three different uh, podcast hosts, uh, which was a lot of fun. We got to talk about a lot of different things. One of the podcasts, kind of funnily enough, one of the podcasts was the whole thing was just about Michael Milken. It's an Israeli um, uh, podcaster who, who does economic and financial history, and he likes to talk about uh, economic and financial history. And uh, he had heard me talk about Milken on this podcast on a number of occasions. I said, hey, I'm doing a whole show on Milken. I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you and then get some quotes from you and then use those in, um, uh, in, uh, in the podcast. So uh, we did an hour interview on Milken, which was a lot of fun. I, I got to remember a lot of stuff that I, f I guess I've forgotten about Milken, about finance, about, about these kind of issues, and, and that was good. And then I did another hour um, of objectivism and the war and economic freedom and individual rights and the difference between objectivism and libertarianism and covered a lot of things, and the third podcast also covered a lot of things. And then I gave a talk on um, war and morality, war and morality, and... Um, the talk is in Hebrew, so many of you will unfortunately never see it. Uh, but um, I thought it was good. I, I thought the talk was good, and I, I, I found it interesting that the the audience was um, from my first sentence. The audience was silent, attentive, focused, engaged. Um, it, it was it was really good. I, it, it was it was it was fun, I think, to do, even though the topic is so horrific. I got some good questions in the Q&A, just a short Q&A, just a couple of questions, but uh, it, it was good. It needed, everything I said needed to be said. I talked about, uh, you know, a, 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 what a self-interested, egoistic uh, execution of a war looks like versus kind of the altruism that dominates um, 
unfortunately, that dominates warfare, including, including this war. I talked about victory, what victory would look like, and what is necessary for victory. And um, I did get asked about the hostages, which is a little heart-wrenching, because I know that there were people in the audience who um, have maybe have relatives as hostages, certainly who know people who are hostages. These are people who live in, in the area where the hostages were taken. Uh, and I had to say, look, you, you cannot run a, a war worrying about hostages. You, you just can't. You, you, have to, you have to win the war, and that needs to be the number one a central focus. If you can rescue some of the hostages, you rescue them. But otherwise, you cannot keep negotiating with the enemy. And, and, and I said, you, you don't negotiate with terrorists. There was, should have never been negotiations. There shouldn't be negotiations. And, uh, you, you know, with terrorists, you, you have to crush them. You have to defeat them. If you can militarily free as many hostages as you can, you should. Uh, but you cannot negotiate. Negotiations only makes things worse. Negotiations only sacrifices the future to the present. And um, ultimately, that sacrifices your existence. Anyway, that was my day. Uh, I think I was speaking for like, I don't know, four or five hours straight. And my throat is feeling it a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully we'll get through to this, uh, this show uh, smoothly. But I'm definitely, um, my throat is definitely itchy. Um, hopefully it's just me talking a lot, not me getting uh, a cold or, or getting sick or anything like that. Uh, all right. Uh, yesterday we talked about the beepers and we talked about the, the, uh, the uh, other communication devices blowing up and, and we kind of covered that. But what I didn't get to is discussing Israel's assassination of um, uh, the Hezbollah uh, really, the, senior, the number one senior military official within Hezbollah, the, the number two within Hezbollah, the, the, uh, since they uh, assassinated uh, the, the previous number two, uh, what was it, a month ago, uh, this guy had risen to number two. He was number three. He became number two. And, uh, and they, they managed to assassinate him. His name was uh, Ibrahim Akil. Ibrahim Akil is the second, the, the, the guy they assassinated a month ago who was the number two, was the other one. Uh, these two are, uh, have been wanted by the United States for decades now. Uh, the United States had a bounty on a kill of $7 million. The other guy, it was $5 million. This guy's even higher up in terms of the U.S. Both accused of uh, planning and participating in the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut and, of course, the U.S. barracks in Beirut where 241 uh, U.S. Uh, Marines uh, were killed. They were also involved extensively during the 1980s in taking U.S. and German hostages in Lebanon, U.S. and German hostages, and of taking hostage the CIA chief uh, from the embassy in Beirut, torturing him and executing him, and then dumping his body. These nice guys have both now been killed by, the United, by Israel. Um, I don't know, curiously enough, shockingly enough, surprisingly enough, I guess, I didn't hear anything from uh, Biden, from Kamala Harris, from uh, National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan, thanking the Israelis for finally getting these monsters. I also would note, and I think it's important for, for, for to all of us to remember, that now, you know, the bombing in Beirut were in 1983. What is it, 40 years, 41 years have passed? It doesn't seem like the United States has troubled itself too much with retribution against people who killed hundreds of, you, of Americans. I, mean, I, I find this just shocking and horrific and horrendous. A, a betrayal, a betrayal of those brave soldiers who, who enlisted in the American military thinking their government would protect them and at the very least, would respond to them being attacked so as to protect future Marines. But nothing. No thanks to the Israelis, but also for 40 years, no real attempt to get these guys. The United States could have gotten them. I, I have no doubt. Everybody knew where they were. So Israel yesterday bombed a, uh, a high-rise, well, not very high, but a, but a, a multi, uh, multi-storied, sto uh, multi, 
an apartment building with, with multiple stories uh, in Beirut, it turned out that Ibrahim Akil, uh, the Hezbollah's operations chief, uh, was meeting with uh, a dozen or more, actually more than a dozen, top commanders in Hezbollah's elite Rad One force. This is a force that has been planning an October 7th-like attack on Israel in the north. They might have actually been meeting to talk about doing exactly that in the north. They have the numbers. They could swarm the border in the north, take over a number of settlements. Ultimately, one of the goals of Hezbollah is to conquer the Galilee, to conquer northern Israel. Uh, anyway, he was meeting with these uh, in a, I guess this was a secret meeting. Uh, this was uh, the entire top staff of the Rad One force. Uh, Ibrahim Akil had been the head of the uh, Rad One, and uh, he was promoted to operations chief because the previous operations chief was assassinated by Israel. Uh, and he was meeting with the, all his top commanders. Israel knew of the meeting, knew the location. The meeting was in, uh, supposedly, not in a lower floor in the building, but underneath the building, in a basement underneath the building. Uh, Israel managed uh, to uh, destroy that basement, destroy the building, and kill everybody inside. They killed Ibrahim Akil, but they also uh, managed to kill the entire leadership, the entire uh, uh, top leadership of uh, Hezbollah's most, most elite fighting force, the Radwan force. Uh, another, uh, you know, dramatic and, and massive blow to Hezbollah itself. This is, of course, following everything that happened with the, um, you know, with the um, beepers and the uh, other means of communication. Uh, Israel is basically dramatically, not a little bit, but dramatically uh, weakened the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the leadership of Hezbollah, their ability to control, their ability to plan, their ability to be strategic, and their ability ultimately, uh, in terms of command and control, to launch attacks on Israel. Uh, again, a, a massive intelligence feat of knowing that this meeting was happening, where it was happening, and having the capability of threading that bomb uh, into that building to destroy everybody in that room. Uh, so, you know, again, kudos to the Israeli military, kudos to the intelligence, kudos to the Air Force, kudos to the ability to pull this off. And, you know, we, we can talk about um, uh, the chain of command within Hezbollah. You've taken out leadership, but you've also taken out probably about 4,000 troops that were injured, some, uh, injured, some of them very seriously, as a consequence of the beepers. So you've taken out a big chunk of Hezbollah. You've taken out their leadership. You've weakened them dramatically. All right, what do you do? Again, are we, uh, are we freezing? Uh, frozen? I'm back. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> that's it. God. Does it, um, uh, does it have a strategy? Does it have a strategy to fix it? You know, one possibility about this freezing internet is that I'm causing the freezing internet. I wonder if, um, I wonder if the hotel has a, um, a limit on, um, on bandwidth uploads. Uh, so I wonder if um, if I cause these hotels' internet to crash because uh, doing the show, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's the Mossad watching me. Maybe it's somebody else. I don't know. Oh, boom. Uh, oh, that was a chazal. Yeah, it's not, 
The problem is not, I, I see you guys are back. Uh, it's not video quality because the problem is uh, that when it works, it's working fine. When it works, uh, upload and download speeds are really good and uh, the quality is good. It's just that it goes, it suddenly shuts down. It basically goes to zero. So um, I, I, I just, I just don't, uh, I, I don't get what causes it. I, I didn't do the show until I was sure that the internet seemed stable. So I, I ran video for a while. What's This sucks, Andrew Traeger says. Yes, it does. It really does suck. Um, and I don't have, um, my, my hotspot doesn't have a good connection here, so it's not like I can switch it onto uh, running it off my phone or something like that. It, it, it's just not enough, there's not enough, uh, there's not a good enough cellular connection here to be able to uh, do that. All right, let me just say again, the real question is for Israel now, what now? Um, what is the point of all this? What is the point of, of diminishing Hezbollah's capabilities? How do you win? You, you know, the, the promise of the Israeli government is to return uh, life to normal in the north, uh, to stop Hezbollah's attacks, to be able to return people to their homes and to normal life in the north. Killing off the leadership has not prevented the, uh, the missile flying. All right, somebody says shut down, uh, shut down other applications and Windows. It's not other applications and Windows. If it was other applications and Windows, um, uh, you know, I, 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 this is the Internet. The Internet is just throttling me uh, somehow. And uh, again, before I went live, it was not an issue. There was no issue. Anyway, uh, let's not talk about that. Let's see if we can get some content in. And if not... We'll uh, we'll have to uh, the the chat doesn't matter. It's not it's not the the chat is not affecting it because it's not my download. It's my ability to upload. That's what's freezing. Um, so uh, again, let me just I, I you know maybe if I shut down video, maybe then it would work. Go to just audio. Uh, that is uh, I don't know how to do that exactly on YouTube. Um, so what does Israel do now? I mean, you would think you would think that given the throttling of the leadership, the command, the control, the communications within Hezbollah, Israel would use this opportunity basically to uh, provide a death blow to the organization. And that would mean invading Lebanon, driving Hezbollah at the north of Litani. And I believe ultimately, um, ultimately it means getting, going to Beirut and going to Beirut and destroying this organization once and for all, at least giving it a, 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 such, a, uh, such a defeat that it would take it years or decades uh, to recover. And then retreating, and then letting the Lebanese clean it up. Maybe the Christians, the Jews, and the Sunni Muslims versus the Shiites, which is the Hezbollah, would actually clean up uh, the remnants of It's bombing the hell out of Hezbollah. It's bombing the hell out of their facilities and, you know, everything that they're, uh, all their military facilities, killing as many of them as possible. But you cannot, you cannot win by doing so. The only way Israel can win, the only way Israel can achieve actual victory is to go into Lebanon and dismantle this organization on the ground. For that, you need tanks, you need personnel. The tanks and personnel, as far as I can tell, are on the Lebanese border and ready to go. The decision needs to be made at the highest levels by Netanyahu and by the Ministry of Defense and the government that this is what is necessary. Instead, they seem to be playing, again, a more sophisticated, more intense game of tit-for-tat, full-blown war, as if this, what's going on right now is not a war.
as if there's no war already. There's, there's already a war. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's as if they want Hezbollah to initiate it and not, you know, uh, not do it themselves. Veldin uh, says, I can't see Israel with ground troops and tanks in Lebanon. It, it, it's going to happen. Um, one way or the other, it's going to happen. They, they're not going to have any, any choice about it uh, because Hezbollah is not going away. They're not stopping. They're not slowing down. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, it's a question of who has the strategic initiative. Does Israel allow uh, Hezbollah to have that initiative? Do they allow them to initiate the terms, the timing, and the way in which this new war happens? Or does Israel actually um, uh, initiate, choose the time and the strategy? Now would be the right time, given what's happened last week. And do they actually um, uh, uh, what's it going to take? I guess is the question I have. Like, if tomorrow Hezbollah launches a barrage of missiles, and like they did today, they, they launched 150 missiles. Most of them fell in empty ground. Uh, one of them uh, hit. Uh, I'd say not most of them. Most of them were shot down. By the, by the Iron Dome. Um, some of them fell in kind of uh, empty, empty spaces, and one hit a home uh, uh, just north of Haifa. And I don't, you know, this is still, this is still not enough to uh, generate a response from the Israeli government. So what's necessary to happen? Uh, is what's going to have to happen, is it going to have to be a, um, that a number of Israelis get killed? How many Israelis need to die so that this government realizes that it's in a full-blown war and uh, actually acts as if it's in a full-blown war and actually does what's necessary to protect the citizens of Israel? And it feels like we're going to kill them, they're going to launch missiles, but if, if one of those missiles hits a home and people die, then we'll invade Lebanon. I mean, that's sick. It's disgusting. And it really is the same strategy that Israel's been engaged in the last 30 years. Like, uh, Hamas will keep attacking Israel, but as long as they're not killing anybody, eh, we, we keep shooting down the missiles, we're not going to do anything about it. And you build up and you build up and you build up to October 7th. So no confidence, no self-esteem, no backbone, cowardice which is, I, I've, I've told you for years now, Netanyahu is a coward, an indecisive coward, an indecisive coward. That is the best description of Netanyahu. This government doesn't, won't do anything. Now, everybody says, okay, you know, it's not Netanyahu, it's really the Americans. And there's certainly a basis for that. I mean, what was, what was uh, you know, the, the Biden administration's response to what has been happening uh, in Lebanon, uh, you know, the, the beepers and the, uh, the killing of Akil and, and uh, the, the senior Hezbollah leadership. What's been the U.S. response? Uh, U.S. National Security Advisor uh, said that he's worried about the risk of escalation between Hezbollah and Israel, that it was now acute. I mean, and I hear this term, escalation, escalation, escalation. You heard, you heard, about Israel and, and Hezbollah, you heard about uh, you heard it about Israel and Hamas, you, you hear it about Ukraine and Russia. I mean, the United States is dominated. This administration is dominated by one emotion: fear. Fear of change. It's not even like it's not even that escalation would lead to some horrific outcome for the United States. Quite contrary. It might actually lead to a good outcome for the United States. The destruction of Hezbollah helps the U.S. And if Iran enters, it well, is an excuse to take out their uh, nuclear program, and well, we all benefit from that. But it's a, it's a, escalation is like, escalation means World War III. Escalation means we're all going to die. Escalation means nukes. And you hear this constantly. 
It's so weak. It's so pathetic. It's so cowardly. And it's so lax in long-term strategy. Escalation now will save escalation later. Escalation now, right now, in Lebanon, puts you in a better position to deal with Hezbollah later on. Or, or sorry, to deal with other Islamists later on, because Hezbollah would be destroyed. It, it's just, uh, all I hear from this administration is, no, no, don't do that, escalation, don't do that, escalation, don't do that. I mean, what's necessary right now in the Middle East is massive escalation. What the Middle East needs right now is a war. What Israel needs, what the United States needs, is to destroy their enemy. And you need a war to do that. I don't know, somebody, I think, is hopeful that uh, maybe Nasrallah will surrender, give up, change his aims and goals, and escalation won't be necessary. But that's fantasy. Complete and utter. Fantasy. Let me read you something. This is what, um, what was I look, looking at? I, uh, let me wait on reading this one second. Oh, what it all was. <laughs> all right, uh, let me read you this. This is what Nasrallah said a few years ago. A few years ago, Nasrallah said, uh, this is a quote from one of his speeches. Lebanon was a Christian country, but we took it, and now it's ours. After we kill all the Jews, after we kill all the Jews in Palestine, we will just have begun. We won't stop until every country on earth is ruled by the law of Allah and the people of Islam, like our prophet promised. I know, you know, most people don't take um, the Islamists seriously. Most people don't think that they are serious about their threats uh, for world domination, their intention for world domination and uh, uh, doing, uh, you know, taking, uh, taking over the world. But the reality is they are serious. They really believe in this. Right? This is what they really want. And we have an opportunity. The West has an opportunity, Israel has an opportunity to actually uh, destroy their capabilities to do so. Now is the time. And yet, they're refusing to do it. They're refusing to do it. <laughs> and says that doesn't sound like just a land grievance. It's not. It's not. Never has been a land grievance. Hezbollah has nothing to do with Israeli land. They're a militant Islamist group, uh, Shiite Muslims, they're not Palestinians, they live in Lebanon, they're funded by Iran, they have no land grievance with regard to uh, Israel. So, um, no, this is, uh, this is just a state of things. So, uh, the West is weak. The West has no self-esteem, no moral backbone, no confidence in what they believe or what they think or what they what they think is good. Um, they are, you know, uh, they are weak and indecisive and refuse to take the action necessary to defend themselves. And the consequences, and this is the sense in which Israel is at the forefront of uh, this whole battle issue conflict. Um, Israel's fighting the war that the entire West is engaged in. And Israel is, um, is at the front lines. This is the war of the West, which Israel is, again, at the front lines of. And the West seems to be withdrawing their support from Israel. Escalation is what uh, they are attacked of, what they are afraid of. Um, all right, let's see. So um, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few days. It's hard to tell. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, Hezbollah wants 
escalation. <laughs> they don't want a war with Israel. They don't want to give Israel an excuse to come into Lebanon. Um, they also have uh, diminished capabilities. They have diminished capacities. So they will continue to launch rockets into Israel, but they've been doing that for 11 months. They might expand as they did today into uh, areas that they haven't bombed before. Like in this case, they bombed um, the areas just north of Israel, the industrial areas just north of Israel, supposedly uh, trying to attack a military base in that area, which is not completely unthinkable. So it's quite possible that that was their intention. Not very good aim. Uh, they were also trying to, um, they claim, trying to attack a um, particular facility um, uh, of, um, uh, what do you call it, a tech company that uh, provides a military tech to the Israeli army. So those were supposedly the targets. They might expand the target list, uh, but they're not going to launch kind of a, a massive attack on Israeli population centers because they don't want to give Israel an excuse to go in. All right, we'll start with this question from yesterday. That, uh, <laughs> um, Ann says, I appreciate you don't want to comment on Leonard's situation, but Harry came out for Kira, and people have said ARI is taking Kira's side due to their interest in Leonard's estate. Can we at least tell them what's baseless? Um, no, I mean, I, I really do think this is a private dispute. I really do want to stay publicly out of it. I, I'd appreciate if you guys would... Um, respect that. But also, I, I will say this. Uh, too many people are, are jumping to conclusions based on non-existent on information they don't have. Uh, too many people are uh, becoming accusatory and nasty um, uh, towards people when they don't have full information. Um, and you don't have full information. So I, I would just suggest everybody calm down let this get resolved uh, by the parties involved uh, and uh, just lay off the social media and the nastiness of social media. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't want to comment more on this. And, uh, but I, I, I just think that what I'm seeing on, on, on Facebook and other places is just, just unnecessary and inappropriate. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, ARI is not taking sides in this. Let me just say that, I, I, you know, and, and it, 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 again, I and ARI view this as a private issue between, um, between uh, father and daughter, and uh, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Maybe one day I'll have more to say about it, but at least for now, we'll leave it at that. And, you know, stay out of it, you, you know. At least verbally, you want to do something, do something, but, but don't, don't make accusations and come to conclusions and make public statements when you don't know the facts. Thomas, did you see Jonah Goldberg's article about the reactions on the left to the paper, uh, pager attacks? I thought he made good statements about Israel's right to defend itself and not hesitating to call Hezbollah a terrorist organization. Yeah, I mean... Jonah Goldberg, for the most part, I like a lot. I, th I think he's very good. He's very good on a lot of these issues. And I thought his uh, condemnation of the left, uh, and again, it wasn't just the left. I don't know if you saw Nick Fuentes and some of these other crazies um, uh, go after Israel as well. So it wasn't just the left. It was primarily the left. And I thought Jonah did a very good job defending Israel, defending its right. If anything, he wasn't strong and vehement enough. I mean, what AOC and others wrote about the beeper attack was just unequivocally disgusting. It was just horrific. And um, uh, divorced from reality and, uh, you, you know, the left refuses, and not just the left, the media, mainstream media more generally, refuse to recognize the, uh, the nature of Hezbollah, the, the fact that it is a terrorist organization recognized as such by the U.S. government, by the British government, by many European governments. Um, they call it all kinds of names, but they won't call it what it is, which is a terrorist organization. Uh, so good for Jonah for recognizing what Hezbollah really is. Good for Jonah. And, and again, Jonah's the kind of conservative that while I disagree with, while he, he, he shows disdain for Ayn Rand, unfortunately, is so much better <laughs> than uh, the MAGA crowd. It's so much more intellectual, it's so much more uh, uh, straightforward. 
I think he's wrong and we disagree and he's often, again, it, it, with respect to Ayn Rand, just, just horrible. Um, he's somebody I think you could have a conversation with and uh, somebody who is, seems to be at least, trying to figure out the truth. So good for Jonah. Um, in, in this case, he's right, right on. Uh, Andrew, this is a mixture of yesterday's questions and today's questions. The ratio of civilian combatants killed by Israel conjured, uh, conjured with the outrage over civilian deaths makes clear that some people do not really believe in the right for self-defense, except in some floating platonic form. I don't think that's exactly right. I think, um, I, I, th I think that their outrage about civilian deaths in the case of Gaza has nothing to do with their not believing the right to self-defense and has everything to do with their hatred of Israel and in many cases uh, has everything to do with their anti-Semitism. Um, I don't think they would deny the right to self-defense to other countries. I don't think they do. Um, I, I, you know, they, they, and I do, they don't deny the right of the Hamas to go on the offensive in couching it to self-defense and killing as many Israelis as they want. Uh, this is, um, to a large extent, uh, uniquely anti-Israel, uniquely anti—you know—anti-Semitic uh, uh, challenge uh, problem that they have. And um, again, you see this primarily on the left, but also on the right, from people who would defend generally the right to self-defense. And if you accuse them of you don't believe in the right to defense, right to self-defense, they would deny it. They would say. It's not an issue of the right to self-defense. It's, right, it's an issue of, to use just war theory terminology, it's, a, it's an issue of um, uh, proportionality. It, you know, Israel is more advanced. It has more technology. It has bigger weapons. Um, it has to be a lot more cautious in using them. It should be a lot more judicious in using them because, uh, because it has so much power. Um, they want to handcuff Israel because it is successful, because it is, because it is rich, because it has powerful weapons. This is altruism at play. This is real altruism, and uh, Israel is suffering because of its goodness, because of its strength, because of its success. That is what that is what driving is driving this. Um, so, again, I I don't think I think it's too in a sense benevolent towards them to say. All right, we're back, frozen and back. Um, all right, let's see, where, where were we in terms of the questions? Um, did, I f did you guys get the, the, the full answer to that question? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it all came across. Hope so. All right, uh, Remo. Uh, Remo asks, what are your favorite tourist attractions in the Bay Area outside of San Francisco. <laughs> um, God, I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, don't th I, I've, I haven't really been a tourist in the Bay Area. I live there. I, I, I don't think there are many tourist attractions per se. I think the, the best tourist attraction in the area is really uh, Route 1, the drive, uh, 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 the drive around Route 1 uh, that goes down the coast from San Francisco all the way down really to Los Angeles. Um, uh, the Monterey Bay, which is beautiful. There's, a, there's an amazing aquarium in Monterey. Uh, really, and the other thing is uh, Carmel, the, the town of Carmel is a beautiful uh, town. It has some great, really good art galleries, but primarily it's just a, it's a beautiful, quaint town on the coast there of California. The coast there is beautiful. You can go on to the, you can drive through that famous golf course. I forget the name of the golf course. There's a famous golf course right there. Enrique reminds me, Sausalito. Yeah, Sausalito is beautiful. It's got a fantastic view of, of San Francisco. It's right across the bay from San Francisco. You can also cross, of course, the Golden Gate Bridge and go up into, uh, into uh, the county, Marin County. Uh, Marin County is very beautiful. Again, uh, forests and co the coast is very beautiful. 
You can go into Sonoma and um, Napa, uh, particularly if you like wines. There's incredible wine tasting. There's phenomenal restaurants. It's just beautiful. Wine country is beautiful. So I tell you, those are the main tourist attractions. Is is in the it, it, surrounding the Bay Area, the, the the scenery is pretty magnificent on the coast and then in the wine country. Um, Andrew, is there any connection between the cowardice of BB and the na and it is nativist collectivism? I mean, it's a good question, but I I don't really have an answer for you. I I I, I don't I don't know. There might be. I, I don't want to. I don't know where the cowardice comes from. It seems to be more psychological. It seems to be a. I mean, in Bibi's case, it seems to be like a, a desperate, a desperate uh, hanging on to power, and and a desire to keep power and 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 and, and not give it up at any cost, uh, even at the cost of your own integrity. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with his nativist collectivism. Maybe if I thought about it, we'd find a connection. Um, and you know, he doesn't want to make. He doesn't want. He's got enough blood in his hands. I don't think he wants to make a mistake and have more blood in his hands. I, I don't think he wants to make a mistake that would turn Americans against him. There's, I, I think any power lester has a certain narcissistic need to be liked, loved, popular, whatever. Um, I mean, it really is amazing, the political maneuvering that Bibi has been doing over the last two weeks to try to stay in power and to try to um, uh, not make a decision and, and, and not make the decisive decision about what to do in Lebanon. I mean, again, everything they did last week was so brilliant. The, the beepers, the, the, the communication devices, the, uh, uh, the assassination of, uh, of the number two of Hezbollah and, and all of his henchmen, all of his officers, and you'd expect that to lead somewhere. You'd expect that to be an entree into a decisive action towards victory. <laughs> and it just hasn't. It's, it's, just, it's just fizzled. It's just nothing has happened. So, um, and at the same time, Bibi's kind of doing all these political maneuverings to try to increase his coalition and, and fire the defense secretary and do all these things. Which he's not succeeded, but but I don't know. There's just something really, really strange about him, and he's an incredibly intelligent man. So it's not a lack of intelligence, but it's something really, I don't know, scheming, manipulative, cowardly, and so on about him that is very unique about him. Excellent communicator, horrible decision maker, unless it comes to politics, and then he's brilliant in terms of staying in power. James, what's Rand's view that most people don't have a self? They haven't developed a self, so they can't be selfish. I, you know, there's a sense in which he believed that people don't have a self, that they haven't developed values, that they haven't developed character, that they haven't developed, they haven't owned their own soul, if you will. They haven't created their own soul. But she believed everybody's capable of doing that. So in that sense, I don't think she thought they didn't have a a self, a self is what creates that character. I, I don't think uh, she believed they didn't have a self and couldn't be selfish. I think it's that they chose not to be selfish and as a consequence, not to pursue values and as a consequence, not to create a soul and, 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 and to have, to, to have a, a complete self. So everybody has a self at some level and everybody's capable in that sense of being selfish. Um, but most people don't exercise it and don't exercise it in a way, uh, in, in a proper way or in a way that actually leads to the right, you know, leads to flourishing or leads to the creation of a, of a real meaningful soul. Uh, Hopper Campbell, what is going to make the people who matter stop ignoring objectivism? Um, I don't know who the people who matter are. I, I don't know who you mean. Right? Who, who do we mean by the people that matter? I, you know, it's, I, I think, look, it's always been the same issue. Um, objectivism will be successful when it has enough intellectuals to dominate the, 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 the intellectual landscape, when it has enough writers, speakers, professors, teachers um, to 
basically flood the marketplace of ideas with objectivist ideas. We have the right ideas, we have good ideas, we have to get them out there. And we have to get them out there in an interesting, um, um, engaging way that, that people respond to. We have to do it in a timely manner on issues that people care about. And I think when that happens, when we have enough of them, and I don't know whether enough is uh, 500 or 1,000 or 10,000, it's hard to tell, but it's, it, to some extent, it's a numbers game. It's a quality game, but it's also a numbers game. We need really good people and, and enough of them. And there are no people who matter. I, I mean, we, you matter. I matter. I, I mean, there are no people who matter out there more than we do. And, and our job is not to influence the politicians or influence the intellectuals. Our job is to replace them. They're not going to change. They're not going to become better unless... The culture demands it, and the only way for the culture to demand it is for us to change the culture. And the only way to do that is to have hundreds, thousands of intellectuals. Liam, uh, as I said, if you guys want to ask questions, Super Chat is the way to do it. Liam says, do you agree with Niles Bohr when he said, quote, an expert is a man who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field? Well, no, and I, I, I don't think Neil Bohr's it, took that definition seriously. It's not a definition. Certainly an expert is somebody who's made a lot of mistakes because the only way, um, the only way to um, actually uh, know a field and progress in a field is to, is to do. It's, it's, it's to teach, it's to write, it's to experiment, it's to try things. And that's going to involve a lot of failure. But I'm sure there are lots of people who've made lots of mistakes in any particular narrow field and are not experts <laughs> because they've learned nothing from it. So it involves making mistakes and learning from them, but also figuring stuff out and knowing stuff. And I don't think it has to be in a narrow field. And it certainly doesn't have to be in a very narrow field. It could be in a wide field. You could still become an expert on, I don't know, ancient history. What mistakes have you made? So I think it's too narrow of uh, attempted definition. It's not really a definition but an attempt at a description, way too narrow. Uh, Maximus, um, latest walkie-talkie and pager attacks, doesn't it make sense to be in control of manufacturing instead of relying on other countries? Didn't I answer this yesterday? I feel like I, I responded to this. Uh, uh, no, um, because I, I did. I, I talked about the iPhone. I mean, what you want is to control the supply chain. You want security in your supply chain. So it makes sense for Apple to be able to have uh, quality control over every aspect of the building of an iPhone. I don't think there's any fear of uh, somebody sneaking explosives into an iPhone given the tightness, or certainly not on a mass scale, given the tightness of control over your supply chain when it comes to developing an iPhone. Now, my, my guess is Samsung does the same thing. And my guess is these pages were not associated with any particular brand. One of the one of the benefits of a brand and having a brand strategy is having quality control. And, and, and therefore, your customers then relying on a particular quality. And uh, if they start bowing up, you lose your business. You're dead. You're finished. So you better control the supply chain. That doesn't involve uh, countries. Now, what is, take Hezbollah, for example. Are they supposed to build beepers in Lebanon? And then Israel's supposed to build its beepers, and then China builds its beepers, and American build. I mean, imagine a world in which we're all trying to be self-sufficient. That is a very, very, very poor world. Very poor. Division of labor is an incredibly powerful thing. And if you can have division of labor over 8 billion people, that is unbelievably more productive than having division of labor over your little country, just in your little country, and not being willing to manufacture elsewhere. You know, the other thing that you need to remember is Israel has unique capabilities in terms of uh, doing these things that most people don't have. I'm not worried about my electronics. I'm not a terrorist. Nobody wants to kill me. Um, or maybe some people do, but uh, nobody, has, nobody who has the capabilities of doing it, will do, it, it wants to kill me. Um, so I, it would be ridiculous to worry about these things. So no, I have no problem in manufacturing things all over the world as long as you maintain control, as long as you maintain quality control. And this is why brands matter. Like there's a reason why you want to buy something like an iPhone or Samsung because 
they have reputational capital invested in your product and it better be decent and it better not blow up because otherwise they are toast. Mary Eileen, what do you think would happen next in the Middle East if Israel took out Yuan's nuclear capabilities? Not much. I mean, really, not much. What would happen? Nothing. Iran would be pissed off. Maybe they'd fire a few missiles towards Israel, but nothing. Nothing dramatic. I mean, I mean, this is the thing. This is why Israel and, and particularly America's cowardice around all of this is so pathetic. Iran, without nuclear weapons, does not pose a threat to America or to Israel. It might pose some threat to the Saudis, but America's sworn to defend Saudi Arabia, so that's not a problem. So Iran does not pose a threat to anybody. It doesn't. So advanced airplanes in Syria, the most advanced surface to air missiles in Syria, they have ground troops in Syria, and yet Israel operates in Syrian airspace, shooting of whatever the hell it wants, and the Russians don't do a thing. The reality is Russia doesn't want to confront Israel, not because it has some, you know, real commitment, um, some real commitment to uh, Israel. It doesn't want to fight Israel because it knows that at least in Syria it will lose. And it doesn't want to show the world how pathetic their weapons are. The world's already seen that in Ukraine. They don't want to emphasize that in Israel. They don't want to use their most sophisticated weapons because they'll discover that those weapons are not very good. It's shocking that the Russians are right there, and Israel bombs, lands special forces, blows up facilities, does all this stuff, and the Russians are just standing by.